Kyle Mandley, he's going to talk about building a solver based on pie claw for the solution of multi-layer shallow water equations. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, so in an effort to try to get back on schedule, um, I will try to go quickly through this. Um, so I don't know why I'm pointing at that thing. It's right here. Um, so the type of work that I've been involved in over the past five to six years is, uh, has primarily actually been on shallow water depth average types of codes. And this is just an example of a type of simulation um, that we've been looking at in the past. So this is shallow water across the entire Pacific. Obviously, there's adaptive mesh refinement going on here. And this is actually the Chile uh, tsunami that was a few years ago. Um, and the intention is to be able to do this on a laptop. So this actually ran on my laptop in a couple hours. Um, so that's the type of problems we're trying to target. Um, today I'm going to be talking a bit more about a new model and how we have taken it from being a pure Fortran code and put it into Python. Um, so this is the type of situation that you should keep in mind that we're trying to solve. So instead of just having one layer, one depth average layer, we have two. It's a fairly straightforward uh, idea. So there, these two layers have an interface right there. And they're, they're different in that they have two different densities. Okay? So the main uh, reason we started looking into this is our want to start doing storm surge uh, simulations. And if you think about storm surge, or if you ever looked into storm surge, um, you have the wind, which is the primary forcing uh, on the ocean, which is at the top, of course. There's a boundary layer there. Um, there's also friction, which actually the two of those balance out, and that's actually what gives you most of your surge. There's pressure in here that affects the entire water column, but that actually doesn't do a whole lot um, in terms of generating surge. So if you wanted to use shallow water for this problem, you can see that the, you know, if these two things, especially in the deep water, are balancing each other, using a single column of water is not necessarily ideal. So we stick that extra layer in there. So in this case, for storm surge physics, we would do something like, you know, this would be a boundary layer of the ocean. So first 100, 200 meters, and then you'd have a very deep layer that would actually go to zero by the time you got to the shelf. So just a quick run through the equations we're solving. Um, this is the coordinates. So it's, again, very similar to the shallow water equations. We have to throw density in there now and treat it uh, explicitly. The equations themselves look very similar to the shallow water equations. There's just two layers on top of each other, and there are coupling terms between those two layers. So one thing is that really what's going on, the, the layers are communicating via uh, pressure uh, only. There's no, there's no like friction between the layers or anything like that. So I'm going to leave equations now and just show you uh, some of the things more programmatically we were concerned with. Um, I have an extra slide in there. How did I apparently copied that? OK. OK, so this is the more interesting part, hopefully, for this conference. Um, so the original code was all in Fortran. Um, and it's a finite volume method based off of claw pack and GeoClaw. Um, it's actually approximately about 10,000 lines of additional Fortran code to get the multi-layer uh, equations to work. Um, we did have Python in there. We were using Python to do the plotting and a lot of the data, input data manipulation. Um, the Python code that we ported this to, um, it's based on PyClaw, um, which is an implementation of ClawPack in Python. Uh, the main work here is done in the what's called Riemann solvers. So those were actually left in Fortran. We used F2Py um, to wrap those. Uh, the remainder was actually ported into Python, and it actually turned into about 400 lines of code. Now, this isn't too surprising if anybody's actually done this exercise before. Uh, but this is all because of you know, being able to reuse code and be able to write more generic code. Um, and of course, we have access to many more extensions in Python that was you know, kind of unthinkable in the Fortran world. So just a little bit more about PyClaw. I've talked about PyClaw multiple times at SciPy before. Um, it's basically a high-level language to ClawPack. Um, it has lots of features. It's developed kind of by leaps and bounds over the past couple years in particular. Um, 
if you're interested in it, you can come talk to me afterwards. The, the main point here is that it has a structure that kind of isolates all the, in, uh, the, the pieces here um, of importance. So PyClaw sits up here and it's kind of talking between the clockback kernels. So this would actually be the Fortran kernels, the Riemann solvers, which are still in Fortran talking through f to pi, through numpy, back through petsy for pi. And the reason why petsy and MPI are down here is that this code actually uh, is able to run in a, on a parallel machine. Um, so that was, a, that's a very nice thing going from Fortran, which requires you to explicitly add things like MPI calls multi, uh, most of the time. Uh, we actually had developed this so that I can drop in my new uh, Python version of the code and I get to run on a supercomputer modulo the import time. So just have some demonstrations here. Um, so this is an idealized shelf. I say idealized because it's uh, a gigantic jump in the bathymetry here. So it's, you know, it's interesting from a mathematical standpoint that it proves that something's working, but it's obviously not very realistic. Um, so if we zoom in, this is, this is actually zoomed out. You can see this is actually on the oceanic scale and depths. Um, if we zoom in, we put a perturbation on the top surface and just see what happens. So you get, notice that the, the, this axis is actually quite small. This is meters, of course. Um, you know, 20 centimeters compared to, this is in, on the order of, of about two or three meters. So the, the internal surface waves are actually much larger uh, regardless of what's going on. We actually have these very high amplitude uh, waves coming off the shelf when the water comes off of the uh, it comes off the shelf it loads that and causes these high amplitude short wavelength waves. Um, so there's lots of different interesting things to talk about here about the mathematics of this and the physics going on here. Um, don't have time unfortunately. So if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, just another oh, so this is just one way to look at it. This is a these are surface contours in time. So. As it goes on, you can see uh, there's just radiating waves back and forth. Um, blue is negative contours on the surfaces, and red is positive. Um, you can see what's kind of going on there. Uh, here's a less idealized shelf. This is a sloped shelf. It's still fairly idealized, but works for our purposes. Um, so just as a, an example, it's basically the same type of setup, uh, and you can see what kind of goes on in this case. Um, so one of the, the points of these demonstrations, as I said, is there's not only are we going to from Fortran to Python, now we have all access to all sorts of interesting packages that we could actually really um, leverage in taking this to new ways to solve these equations. For instance, uh, IMEX methods. Well, we, don't, we don't have IMEX methods in, uh, in ClawPack. But we can use Python implementations of IMX methods with this now, and we can start looking at new ways to do things instead of having to take a lot of time to implement them. So this is the same thing as surface contour is a little bit more interesting, um, mainly because there's a, there's a sloping shelf there, so you have uh, curves in the contours. Um, this is a, an example that's supposed to show that these equations aren't perfect. Um, so, wow, I don't know how that got moved. Um, so this is basically a bathtub with two layers of water, um, and we just have an oscillatory uh, wind going. So it's just a wind that goes back and forth. So it's just trying to stir up the tub. You could also rock the tub back and forth, but that's harder to implement. Um, so if we start this thing, so there's, there's multiple interesting things going on here, of course, but. Uh, one of them is that you don't see any surface change in the top surface. And this is one of the, the difficulties of, of doing these types of simulations. Um, this actually simulation stops because it becomes non-hyperbolic. So if I, let's see, let's go back again. So if you see this, you can kind of, well, it looks realistic, you know, or some, of some sort. And the water kind of is doing crazy things. And all of a sudden, well, OK. So something's going on there. The physics kind of suggests there's a Kelvin Helmholtz instability there that should be occurring. Um, the model that we're using here, the multilayer shell order equations, doesn't have that. So our equations break down. So that's just a representation of that. 
Um, of course, the driving idea here was storm surge, so I thought I should probably show you some storm surge calculations. This is actually just an idealized storm surge, so um, this is actually very similar bathymetry. There's a beach here over on the right. Um, these are the surfaces as a hurricane is going to come over from the left. It's a little red dot. Um, you see, in this case, actually, the, the internal surface has a huge deformation compared to the top surface. Um, until it reaches its dry state, which is right here. And, you know, th crazy things happen and people on the, in Galveston are all worried and things like that. Um, it's a little bit more interesting and illustrative to actually look at what the, the currents are. So this is just the speeds um, of the water as the hurricane comes ashore. So this is the exact same simulation, just the currents. Um, so you can see there's much higher currents in that top layer. So that was kind of the reason why we wanted to try this out, is we kind of expect that there's high currents in the deep ocean, but if we have a single layer, we're not going to see those, You're not, because it's divided and, and averaged over the entire depth. So there's, there are large currents here. Um, there are some currents that get generated way up here, but in the bottom layer, but they're not, still not very significant. Um, so this is ongoing research. We're trying to adapt this to more realistic, you know, like Gulf of Mexico, for instance, um, to try to improve uh, efficiency in storm surge calculations, but also um, just increase veracity and these types of things. And this is all in Python now. So this is actually, it's going just as fast, if not faster, because we can actually leverage the parallel implementation of PyClaw that was not available in ClawPack. So that's lots of nice things in that. So I have a wish list. Um, I wish I knew about Basemap earlier. I don't know how many of you actually use, actively use Basemap, but it actually is kind of awesome. Um, and I didn't realize it. I was implementing all sorts of projections and all that type of thing beforehand. And I, that, was, that was stupid. I don't know why I, was, I did not look at this earlier. Um, Bathymetry topography tools do exist for the geophysics, geoscientists out there. As a mathematician, I don't really like to deal with that stuff. I'm kind of lazy, which is why I'm in mathematics and do programming stuff. Um, so if you have bathymetry topography tools you really like, let me know. Uh, there are some out there that aren't bad, but nothing that I've really come to appreciate very much. Um, and this actually is related to the bathymetry topography tools. If I have a very fine set of someone going out and taking transects of some channel, I have to go back and say, do the interpolation of that dirty data and you know, all the stuff. You, know, you can go into hidden data problems or no data and interpolating onto fine and coarse data sets. And I, uh, that is not something I want to deal with. I want to go to the math and I, I want to do that and I don't want to move that as far down as possible. And it's not something I found particularly easy to figure out how to do. So with that, um, that's my talk, unless someone wants to uh, quiz me on my performance claims at all. Um, so thank you very much. It takes a little bit. That come through. Any questions for Kyle? No. I have to say uh, this same thing about the bathymetry and to topography tools. Uh, uh, my background's in subsurface where the geostatistics is a natural, uh, it's already a developed field and it always drives me nuts that we don't have nice tools for interpolation, sort of upscaling and downscaling of bathymetry data. And it's just getting worse with all the satellite data and, and LIDAR and all that that you can't use for simulation, but it's reams of data that everybody thinks should be usable. So. Yeah, it's you, not have you, <laughs> yeah, have you seen, I mean, is there anything out there uh, that is really focused on that problem? I wrote my own. I didn't find anything. I mean, I'm using SciPy Interpolate, which, you know, I can make choke on stuff, and I don't know. I haven't found anything. I don't know, maybe Darhaz has. <laughs> well, I, um, again, um, this is a big problem with bathymetric data, and we built our own tool not so much for, for solving one particular problem, which is when you uh, have a channel or something curved, you need to interpolate along the direction the river is going. If you just do a sci-fi interpolate or anything like that, you'll get weird data. So we've got a little package we built for that, which okay. is pretty easy to use. So, 
um, Pi Hat, but we're, I'm trying to release it right now, so it's not quite out there, but we can talk later. My problem is I want to go to structured grids, which means I have to interpolate onto, like take unstructured data and put it on the structured data, because I'm also lazy in that aspect. <laughs> um, there's multiple difficulties I run into. I think someone has a question. What, what session tomorrow? Okay, great. So it'll be same time tomorrow. Yeah. Well, let's thank Kyle again. So next up we have Andy Terrell, and uh, I don't remember what the name of his talk is either. I know he's going to be telling us about domain-specific languages, and he's at the uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center here at University of Texas. Domain-specific languages for partial differential equations using ignition. Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks.